Welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. My name is Lisa, and I'm your NOAA Central Library host. Today's presentation, a robust and effective research development and transition enterprise, is the fourth in a five-part series sponsored by the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee, focusing on the 2020 NOAA Science Report. Eric Baylor, the NESDIS committee member, will introduce today's four speakers. Before I hand the mic to Eric, I, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and often resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. We want to hear your questions, so please feel free to type them in the questions chat box located in the control panel. However, let us know to whom the question is addressed by indicating the name of the person you would like to answer your question. Questions will be answered at the end of all the presentations. All audience members are muted, so please use the question chat box to communicate with me or the speakers. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic's all yours, Eric. Hello, all. I'm Eric Baylor, the NESDIS representative on the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee. It's a cross-line office committee of the NOAA Science Council. This committee is responsible for the development of the NOAA Science Report with input from contributors across NOAA. The sponsors for this seminar include the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee and the NOAA Central Library. I want to thank the NOAA Library staff, especially Lisa Clark, for their valuable assistance. The NOAA Science Report is an annual report that highlights NOAA's scientific accomplishments for the year and reflects NOAA's re research priorities. Celebrating NOAA's research and development, the NOAA Science Report comprises four sections, an introduction, science highlights, bibliometrics, and NOAA's scientific workforce. Together, they highlight how NOAA's research products impact the lives of all Americans. The 2020 NOAA Science Report will be released later this month on the NOAA Science, science Council website. Stay tuned. Uh, the 2020 NOAA Science Report spans the entire range of NOAA's mission, highlighting more than 60 stories that represent the accomplishments of NOAA employees and partners. And today we welcome four speakers whose work features models, satellite sensors, and products. The full bibliographies for the speakers today can be found on the website uh, description of today's webinar, so I will simply identify the names and affiliations of our speakers in order to save more time for their presentations. Our speakers are Dr. Arnaud Chouillet, a senior research scientist with the University of Colorado Boulder and at NOAA NCEI, NOAA Centers for Environmental Information, or NESIS, NOAA Centers for Environmental Information, excuse me. Uh, Dr. Kristen Calhoun, a research scientist with NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory. Dr. Thomas Delworth, senior scientist with NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory and Dr. Gong Lu, an associate research scientist with the Cooperative Institute for Satellite Earth System Studies, SISIS, at, and Earth System Science at Interdisciplinary Center, ESSEC, at the University of Maryland. Uh, each of the four speaker, speakers <laughs> will give a 10-minute presentation, and then we will have a question and answer session after all of the presentations. I'd like to invite Dr. Shulia to kick off our presentation. Dr. Shulia, are you ready? So, over to you. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, okay, so I will. Um, thanks for the invitation to to speak at this seminar, and I will uh, talk today about two geomagnetism models that were released um, in 2020, or soon before 2020. Um, so the first model is uh, the world magnetic model. Um, it is a um, data-based spherical harmonic model of the Earth internal core field up to degree 12, which corresponds to wavelength of approximately 3,200 kilometers at the Earth's surface, and including uh, the secular variation of the internal field. Um, it's a joint product of uh, the US National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, and the UK's counterpart, the Defense Geographic Center, uh, and it is jointly developed by NCEI and the British Geological Survey. This model is updated every five years, and we released the WMM 2020 in December 2019, and uh, accompanied with its technical report in, in 2020. 
So the, the map you can see here uh, on the screen shows um, the declination, which is the angle between the direction um, of the magnetic north and the direction of the geographic north. Uh, so the map shows the magnetic declination in the continental United States and around uh, in 2020 as predicted by the WMM. So for example, you can see that declination is uh, zero in, uh, in some states here like Louisiana, for example, um, and Arkansas, etc. Whereas on the East Coast, it's going to be negative, And on the West Coast, the declination is, is positive. Um, so this model comes with uh, software, with uh, online calculators uh, that, that can be found on the NCI website. And so, for example, this is a screenshot of the online calculators for the WMM uh, that gives um, the magnetic declination and its uh, change, um, its current change as, as, as yesterday in, in Boulder. Uh, so that was, for example, eight degrees and, and seven minutes towards the east with uh, some uncertainty of 22 minutes. So this uh, full magnetic model is, is widely used um, by uh, government uh, and also industry. Uh, so this slide shows um, the main users on, on, on the government side. Uh, NOAA is a user, obviously. Um, this model is used, for example, in nautical charts. Um, the military is, uh, is a big user of the WMM and actually the funder the, is funding this research uh, through NOAA. Um, so um, applications range from undersea navigation uh, to attitude control to degaussing to antenna tracking, for example. Uh, other government agencies use the, the WMM as well. And uh, what is, for example, among the industry users, the smartphone industry is a big user of the WMM. So if you have a smartphone, there is a a high probability that the WMM is uh, embedded in the software of your smartphone. And when you, when you use the Compass app, it will actually rely on the WMM to, to make the correction uh, to, uh, to, to indicate the magnetic knob. And of course, the general public is also a user of the WMM for, for various applications. Um, so and it, when we look, the magnetic field is a complex um, phenomenon at um, you know global scale and um, it, it contains various features that are not worthy and and that uh, there is active research going on in trying to understand um, why I mean how the magnetic field evolves over time what generates the magnetic field in your score um, but uh, for example there are some features that are particularly not worthy because uh, you know they are very visible and they, it can uh, capture the imagination. So one of them is the, the magnetic pole drift. So if uh, um, the magnetic pole is the point at the Earth's surface uh, where the magnetic field is exactly vertical. So there are, actually there are two magnetic deep poles, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. And it is showed in red here on this on the map, on the right hand side of the of the slide. And you can see that the magnetic pole has, has moved um, um, pretty much in a linear uh, in linear path from 1900 to 2020 here. So that's the latest position uh, predicted by a model very similar to the WMM, which is called the IGRF. Um, and what is noteworthy here is that there was an, an acceleration of the magnetic pole drift over the 1990s, where the, the average speed went up from 15 kilometers per year up to 55 kilometers per year. And in recent years, we have observed that the speed has slightly decreased um, below 50 kilometers per year. So the current model predicts uh, that the magnetic pole will continue um, moving towards uh, Siberia, but you know, at a reduced speed. We are unable at this point to, to forecast the future evolution beyond a few years. Another important uh, feature of the magnetic field is the dipole strength which is a good proxy for the overall magnetic field strength at the global level. And uh, because the dipole represents about 93% of the total power of the magnetic field, and it's been in the downward trend since uh, the 19th century. And this has been confirmed by the 
most recent WMM released uh, last year. Um, so the, the particularity of the WMM compared to other similar models, for example, like the IGRF, is that the WMM has to meet uh, Department of Defense specification, <clears throat> and um, uh, you know this is this uh, this specification has to be met, which means that in practice we are monitoring, we are constantly monitoring uh, the performance of the WMM as um, along the five-year cycle between each release. Um, so NOAA is monitoring the, the, the performance of the WMM. Um, WMMs are derived from um, satellite data that are collected currently by the SWARM three satellite mission of the European Space Agency. So these are very accurate data, and uh, this is uh, very helpful for us to um, for for you know for calculating the WMM. Um, so the 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 graph here shows um, the the temporal evolution of um, the model error for one component, which is the grid variation north, which is the declination above a certain latitude in the northern hemisphere. And you can see that at the time the model is released, uh, so for example here in 2010, um, the error is minimal. It's very close to the, the floor of the error, which is the omission error caused by the unmodeled sources of the Earth's magnetic field. I mean, the components of the Earth's magnetic field, which are not included in the WMM. And then as time goes forward, the error increases because of our inability to uh, correctly forecast the nonlinear part of the secular variation. And then when a new model is released, the error is brought down to uh, very close to the floor, to the omission error. So this is what happened again in 2020. And uh, we, we see that, that here now in 21, we are still very close to this, uh, to this floor. What uh, an, an interesting um, uh, event happened a couple of years ago, where um, we we had to um, we had to update um, out of, to do to do an out of cycle update of the world magnetic model in 2018 uh, in order to bring this error down a little bit ahead of schedule because there um, it was uh, considered that um, there was some risk that the, the the military specification would not be met before the end of the five year interval. So this green curve here shows what the error um, the error of the uh, out of cycle update of the WMM, which uh, I mean, as you can see here, uh, solved the, the situation. Um, another model that was uh, that is being developed by NOAA and that's been uh, released last year. Um, it was an annual update, but a pretty significant one is the high definition geomagnetic model. So um, the, the Earth's magnetic field has many different sources. The fluid core is the main one. It accounts for about 95% of the total Earth's magnetic field. But there are other sources in the Earth's lithosphere, um, but also in the Earth's ionosphere. In the, I mean, there are electrical currents over there, especially on the day side of the Earth. And also further away in the magnetosphere, there is, for example, the ring current uh, all around the Earth uh, that gets particularly large during magnetic storms. So all these sources are not accounted for by the WMM. And there are some users that need some more accurate models than the WMM. And the high definition geomagnetic model is one such model. It, uh, the, the HDGM uh, attempts to describe not only the, the, core, um, the, the core field, but also uh, the, the magnetic field generated by magnetized rocks in the lithosphere and also the, the, the time varying fields created by external sources. So for the, it relies on ground-based measurements made by the USGS at magnetic observatories and also on solar wind measurements made by the Discover satellite at uh, the L1 point between the Earth, the Earth and the Sun. And this model is updated annually. So um, you know the, the, the issue of the, uh, the increase of error due to nonlinearities in the secular variation that I just mentioned um, is not uh, relevant for this model because, because of the more frequent updates. Um, so the, the HDGM 2020 uh, was um, included some significant improvement and one of them was the fact that um, the crustal field was based on um, a newly uh, developed um, earth magnetic anomaly grid 
Um, so this is another product, um, one of NOAA's uh, geomagnetism product where um, um, the, the magnetic anomalies are described on a local, on a global level. And it incorporates um, 50 million more points, uh, data points than the previous anomaly grid, which was released 10 years ago. Um, so these are mostly data collected by ships and also by um, by air um, on board airplanes, so airborne survey data in various regions of the world. Um, so you can see the, the EMAC2 version 3 map is shown here on this slide. And uh, you see that there are some um, interesting features, for example, in our continents, uh, many more anomalies here, for example, than, than in some oceanic areas like here. So the, the new HTGM includes all this information. Uh, we also updated the coffee model using the latest swarm data. And um, uh, another improvement that, uh, that was made last year was to include some short-term forecasting of disturbance fields of external origin uh, using machine learning. So this is still ongoing research, and, uh, we, but we, we, we made the first, uh, um, the first version of this product. Uh, the HTGM users are, are, um, are mostly in the oil and gas industry sector. Um, um, for example, in, for directional drilling. So directional drillers need to, to navigate underground where they don't have access to the GPS signal. And, and so they, they rely, among other things, on the Earth's magnetic field to do that. And the HTGM um, you know, is a product that, was, um, um, that comes with a software and some documentation and also an error model that can be directly used by, by this community. And they, uh, the, the way they do that is that they, they, they collect magnetic field measurements uh, you know, very close to, as close as possible to the drill bit here. And then uh, they have some calibration process where they can correct for the magnetic effects of, uh, of all the equipment that's there, and then they compare with, uh, with the HTGM. And this helps them to, to navigate more safely on the ground, and this in particular reduces the risk of collisions. So this model was validated in partnership with industry, with Schlumberger, uh, which has been very supportive of this effort since the beginning. Um, and I think I will conclude here. So um, NOAA's geomagnetic models are widely used by government and industry, mostly for navigation. Um, forecasting future core field changes is challenging due to our limited understanding of core processes. And that's why we have to rely on uh, continuous data collection. Um, the WMM 2030 model, so 10 years from now, uh, is, um, you know, we are already planning for that and, it's, and especially uh, NGA on the DOSD side is, is planning for that, and uh, it will likely be based on data collected by nanosatellites as well as uh, possibly the iridium communication satellites. Results from uh, a NOAA sponsored magnets challenge um, are expected to improve machine learning forecasting of short term magnetic variations. So the challenge was completed um, just a few weeks ago, and um, uh, we, we we expect that uh, the HTGM will benefit from the results of this challenge as well. And finally, I will just say that uh, we have a, a smartphone app. The name is CrowdMag. It was developed by, by our group at NOAA and CEI. And uh, I encourage everyone interested to, to download this app from either the Google Store or the App Store. And uh, if they want to learn more about the WMM, and also they have the uh, CrowdMac users have the opportunity to become citizen scientists by sending us data collected by their smartphones. And, and finally, these are the links to, uh, you know, our, our research group and also the, the NOAA pages uh, where you can uh, download the models and, and learn more about uh, this activity, this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shulia. I find that a very excellent presentation, very interesting. I, I knew the poles moved, but I didn't realize that the North Pole was moving quite that rapidly. Our next speaker is Dr. Calhoun. Um, when you're ready, please take it away. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. I'm, your uh, screen is blanked out though, so. Oh no. There you go, perfect. Okay. 
I apologize about that. All right, um, so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the innovations we've been doing with the geostationary light lightning mapper, which is on our new Gozar series of satellites. So this is a brand new instrument in geostationary orbit. And when we started getting the data, we needed to think about what it actually should look like for the operations. And by that, uh, I'm primarily referring to the National Weather Service. And so for this project, um, this is a collaborative effort between academia, uh, private sector, and across NOAA and NASA. So it was really a multi-agency uh, development. On the right here is a raw image from Lockheed Martin, what the uh, GLM basically looks like. Um, so you have the cloud patterns and then the bright areas uh, are giving you um, lightning across the hemisphere at that time. So typically, uh, historically, lightning detections um, have been detected by radios or VHF radiation, and that's represented by a plus or a minus. Or if you're looking on like a TV uh, broadcast meteorologist, they might show it as a bolt or some kind of symbol. But usually it's like a point-based object. And we can represent the geostationary lightning mapper that way. On the right, uh, gives you an idea of what the GLM would look like. Um, if you just pull up like the raw data from our level two feed and put in um, essentially what are events, the base detections, and then we can do a flush, flash clustering algorithm and then bring that into groups, which are in this image here are circles or the flashes, um, red triangles. So that's kind of the historical way lightning data is looked at. But at its heart, uh, geo, the GLM is an optical sensor. And it would be preferred if we can create kind of a gridded imagery that we can animate and show next to other weather satellite images and make it really more suitable for diagnosing thunderstorm uh, intensity and behavior. So, but if, because this charge coupled device, the CCD um, from this camera is kind of, the array is shaped differently than a standard lat, lat long grid. Um, the projection, if you bring just the events into a standard um, operating system, whether it is like the NWS display, uh, which is called AWIPS, or it's in a standard, just any kind of lat long grid, it causes problems between the spatial differences in the array. You can either get aliasing or double counting, all sorts of problems. And that's what we first saw when we brought in the data um, to put in front of forecasters and realize quickly this is a problem. So, um, like many problems, just a little bit of ingenuity in here, just a bit of math. Um, and then we can begin to get all sorts of other information and grid that. So not just that a flash occurred, but we actually know because of the camera that um, this aerial extent of a lightning flash. And that's important because when you look at um, thunderstorm electrification in and around the updraft, which controls the storm strength, uh, you have a lot of charge being produced. And basically you get small pockets of charge with and next to each other, so of opposite polarity. So lightning flashes, a lot of them will occur, but they won't have far to go. Um, whereas out maybe in a stratiform area where you get a larger charge, a lot of charge over time, you get really big flashes. And so that's information that's new from the GLM compared to other lightning detection systems. And we really wanted to produce that kind of information out there. So with this array being slightly different shape than a standard light lawn, what we can do is then we can account for maybe jitter in the satellite. Um, if there's a little bit of shaking at a given time, we can also account for that and get an accurate representation of what, kind of where the lightning flash is. So ultimately what that looks like now um, for the operational forecaster is uh, something like this. So these are three examples of the products. Top left here is our flash extent density. So uh, the peak numbers of flash extent density is where you have the highest amount of lightning. And like I said before, um, where you have the highest amount of lightning is really driven by the updraft um, dynamics of that storm. So a lot of ice, ice collisions, you're getting a lot of lightning, that's gonna be our most intense storms. Um, to the right, I'm showing kind of an average flash area, which is what we were first showing. And I'll get to what um, it became towards the end. But the idea here is on the kind of Southwest end, you have smaller flashes that are gonna be with the newest storms, the newest updrafts, and then um, back, looking further east and then a little bit north, you have bigger flashes represented by that dark purple. And that gives you like one single big flash, which can help um, forecasters know that lightning activity is possible in an area that maybe you'd be concerned about like soccer games restarting again. Uh, bottom left is optical energy, something again that's brand new from this instrument and we're still working out what this means, but 
basically what it is is a measure of the light getting back to the instrument. So um, we're getting kind of a continued view of how much lightning is going in an area and how well we see it through the cloud. The bottom right gives that kind of historical view of lightning detections. These are just like the raw pulses and points and then flashes detected by um, the private company Earth Networks. So what we do is we create these um, various products and we think, okay, yeah, these are representative of the instrument. And then we bring them into the hazardous weather test bed, which is in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, and during non-COVID times, we have lots of people there coming, particularly in the spring. And we use the experiments with forecasters to determine what products are needed, what the visualizations look like, do they play well with other um, things they're looking at, and what training, uh, training requirements are really needed as we push this out to the field. So we look at these new algorithms uh, and we can create new algorithms um, working with the forecasters. So before I showed the average flash area, well, working with forecasters, we realized the important product is more something like minimum flash area because the forecasters care about where the strongest updrafts are and where we're seeing those small flashes. And then the large flashes are gonna still stand out because they're uniquely in their area alone and we're not doing anything to like average them down. And then in the test, but we're also creating best practices and recommendations for the full operational implementation. So, like I said, there's a number of products. This is an example um, from our forecaster display uh, off the coast of Florida. So we're looking at a number of storms that have moved off the East Coast there. And on top left is that flash extent density. Again, peak values are giving you the most intense storms. Event density there in the center top is giving you kind of the idea of where um, just a lot of detections are happening by, uh, by the satellite. Uh, top right now is that new minimum flash area with the bright yellows emphasizing the newest and strongest updrafts. Uh, average flash area, you can see how those signals of those main updrafts are damped down when we do the averaging um, on the next row. And um, going across that row to the center right, there's that optical energy. And then we can do the centroids and points like you would see from the other things like you see in the bottom row. And then that's against uh, bottom right is the advanced baseline imager, and you're looking at the IR and uh, kind of a sandwich with some visible imagery. So a couple of key findings that we found in the test bed and working with forecasters, when used in conjunction with radar data, the GLM lightning trends allowed forecasters to make warning decisions earlier and more confidently. So we're not asking them to make decisions, warning decisions, just using the lightning data, but if they've been looking and seeing trends in, that match lightning between the radar and lightning, that'll help with their confidence on just pulling the trigger and getting that warning out there a little bit sooner. Um, forecasters also found additional utility in the GLM data and pulse environment connect, convection. So watching things going up and down that maybe are sub-severe, but it can help anticipate storm growth or dissipation. And then understanding the extent of lightning that for threats such as decision support um, applications where like maybe the forecaster is working with an emergency manager in a location where maybe they have like an outdoor festival or something for their city and they're trying to say, is this safe for people to be outside? So some examples of that in the test bed, this is an example of um, uh, the forecasters that chose to issue a couple of tornado warnings, watching uh, the cyclic nature of some storms increasing in intensity, both again, first on radar, but then see seeing that same signal in um, the lightning data, so this, that flash extent density where you're, they're watching the pulsing of the amount of lightning in that area gave them confidence to issue that. Yes, I agree, we're seeing kind of the signal of this updraft intensifying and it matches what I'm seeing on the radar data with the uh, velocity in increasing. And so it just makes that confidence in issuing that tornado warning. In addition, not just choosing to warn, but choosing not to warn. So. This is an example of the forecaster was looking all along the line and noticed uh, the radar um, was still kind of there towards the northern end, but the lightning was dissipating and they chose to not warn on the northern end of the line as it seemed to be moving into a more stable air mass. And the lightning trends helped them make that decision not to warn and really to concentrate on that very southern end, mostly for their warning decisions. This is an example of uh, kind of decision support or airport weather warnings that they were using the lightning data for. So um, as you would expect, you'd have a warning probably on that main line that drips down um, south of the Chicago area. So you can see this is off of Lake Michigan and then Chicago just on the southern end of that and then looking out Juliet and going into 
further out into Illinois, you see that strongest line, but lightning's also occurring back towards Chicago and going across the lake. Um, so in this case, the forecaster pointed out that the GLM products really captured that larger flash extent that extended out into that stratiform area that was north of behind the main line that was really not shown in the bottom right uh, panel here of uh, that activity going out towards the O'Hare airport. Um, and that was really what they found important is capturing that extent and that information. So um, at the end of our experiments, we came up with some recommendations for the operational implementation. And um, we're going through that process now of rolling out the GLM graded products. Um, right now they're being calculated in addition to the idea is that we move it into the NESDIS ground-based system products for, these will become baseline products from GLM. So that includes like things like the flash extent density and the minimum flash area that we showed earlier in the forecast is really uh, used and liked. Um, we're gonna continue training efforts with local um, NWS offices. I like the idea of developing and using local subject matter experts. So somebody on hand to speak to other forecasters and then stressing the impact of um, the extent information from the lightning data for decision support services. Um, we recommend the forecasters use the GLM products in conjunction with these other ground-based lightning detections and that helps kind of deal with things like parallax when we're detecting lightning from space and then um, the extent of the GLM really provides that full picture of the storm intensity and threat together. So um, as we go forward integrating the geostationary lightning mapper data into the severe weather warning process promotes earlier warning decisions, better assessment of the aerial coverage of the hazards, and uh, can help with fewer false alarms. And especially, we've seen it already helpful in the field for um, periods of radar outages or in regions of poor radar coverage, such as the Western United States. And so um, that, I'll end with that. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, I wasn't aware how much of information could be extracted from the GLM. Wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Delworth. And are you about ready? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks very much. What I'd like to talk about is a, is a goal that we have had to develop a system for making climate predictions across a seamless range of time scales, all the way from the sort of seasonal predictions of things like El Nino out to centennial scale, century scale projections of climate change. And this is different because in the past, there have been two different sorts of prediction systems and modeling systems. One for the shorter term uh, seasonal time scale involving upper ocean and, and atmospheric response. And the other for the long-term response of the global climate system to rate of forcing changes, greenhouse gases and aerosols. So here we're trying to develop those all into a, a seamless unified system. And why should this be seamless? What's the advantage? Because they're very similar phenomena that operate across the entire set of time scales and climate system, droughts, storms, ocean circulation. They don't know whether they're due to a short-term seasonal anomalies or long-term response to rate of forcing changes. So we wanna have this seamless environment across the time scales. We also suggest that if we have demonstrated skill in such a system at short-term predictions, that can enhance the robustness of using that same system for long-term climate change projections. If you're studying how something like El Nino or Pacific Ocean circulation will respond to increased greenhouse gases, there's an extra sense of robustness if you have already demonstrated skill at using that same system for short-term predictions. And why a new system? Well, a lot of advances recently at GFTL. GFTL is a geophysical fluid dynamics laboratory located in Princeton. And our focus is really on developing new modeling capabilities for the climate system. So recent advances in a number of aspects have really helped us to create more accurate simulations and then predictions uh, going forward in that. So the modeling system we use is something called GFTL SPEAR. GFTL is our laboratory name. SPEAR is an acronym for the uh, seamless system for prediction and our system research. You can see how you get SPEAR out of that. Seamless represents this unified approach. Prediction is something we wanna do and Earth system research is also a key aspect of this. So this is a modeling framework composed of an atmospheric model, an ocean model below, and a land model. They are very latest, greatest components that we have really in the US, the FE3 dynamical core, it's using the Operational Weather Service model right now, developed largely at GFDL, that dynamical core. Uh, MOM6 is the ocean model, modular ocean model version six. 
gets used at a wide range of US institutions now, the latest numerics and physics for representing the ocean and a very up-to-date land model. There's a reference where you can, uh, you can see this uh, paper described. So just visually, how do we talk about using models for both predictions and projections? So on the left, it's really a suite of pr uh, predictions, the schematic of it. In a, in a prediction environment, we take observations, uh, Argo floats or floats that measure subsurface ocean temperature salinity. We take an atmospheric temperature, winds, moisture, et cetera, et cetera. We place those within a model. Typically, there's some sort of uh, numerical process to massage the data and model to make them more compatible using it's an assimilation process. And then we put those in the system and we use our sphere prediction and projection model to make seasonal and longer term predictions. We participate in something called the North American Multimodal Ensemble, NME, a consortium across North America that produces seasonal predictions in about five different centers across the US and Canada. We also do decadal predictions with the same model. We initialize the, particularly the internal state of the ocean and make uh, predictions out a decade in advance showing how the low frequency changes in the ocean can impact climate, particularly in the Atlantic Ocean. We, we're also in this prediction model, we're putting in the atmospheric composition changes, aerosols and greenhouse gases, so it's a unified system. The right side shows how we use exactly the same system to make projections. Here we take this same model and we run it for decades to centuries driving it by these atmospheric composition changes, exactly the same model. We think there's a real sense of a knowledge transfer. We have a unified system here where the short-term predictions operate in the same system as the long-term projections. We think there's a lot of pot imp uh, potential for improvements in both. If we look at uh, multi-decadal changes in things like drought over North America, and if we use the same model to make predictions, we have some synergy here between the two sorts of time scales. That's why we're approaching this in a very seamless fashion. That's very different, different than, say, the typical IPCC type model, which is really just focused on the right-hand side projections and doesn't benefit from making predictions on shorter time scales and the sorts of interactions that can occur on those things. So here's another example of what we mean by predictions versus projections. So on the left, are predictions for topical Pacific sea surface temperature. So this is actually starting in one March of this year, March 2021, going out March, August, December, February. And this y-axis is temperature anomaly in the tropical Pacific. Negative values mean cold, positive values mean warm. And so this is a, a prediction system for, predi for predicting El Nino, this warming and cooling of the tropical eastern Pacific. So these were our actual predictions started on, on one March. All of the red lines here represent an ensemble of forecasts. We, we run many different realizations of a forecast because there's lots of chaotic internal variability. So a single realization isn't a good representative. Well, we can see this predictions we make. It showed a, we were in a La Nina, that's an, a cool Eastern Pacific this past winter. We show some tendency over the summer to warm and then a, a tendency to go back into another La Nina next winter. So this is an example of using this system, this unified system for a particular case of seasonal predictions. On the right-hand side is how we use the system for things like projections. And here we use exactly the same model, but now we run it out over the course of a century. And we, we give that model changes in rate of forcing that is changes in greenhouse gases, uh, CFCs, aerosols, things like that. And then we look at how the statistics of the climate system change in this exact same seamless framework. Here's an example looking at Alaskan summer temperatures and in 2019, there was a very strong heat wave across uh, central Alaska, southwestern Alaska, and it caused a lot of disruptions. So we can see that illustrated here with this red dot. So this is time in year 1950, 2000. Now these are projections of the future. And this y-axis is a temperature anomaly, where here's zero and positive means obviously warmer than normal. This dashed line is a reference to the amplitude of this extreme heat wave over that occurred over Alaska in 2019. And this blue sort of envelope, the solid blue line in the envelope, represents an ensemble of simulations in which we only give the model changes in natural rate of forcing. That's changes in solar irradiance or changes in volcanic aerosols, but we don't tell it anything about what humans have done to the climate system. And this model result suggests that this particular year, 2019, would not would have been unprecedented in terms of its heat just purely from uh, if we hadn't intervened in the climate system, if there were no greenhouse gas forcing. The bottom uh, panel shows a very similar set of experiments, but in which we allow or we put into the model increases in CO2, aerosols, and other forcings that have been observed up till about 2015, and then projections going to the future. And we can see the envelope of model simulations, we run 30 cases here, now has begun an increase in the late uh, 20th century. 
And this extreme heat event in 2019 is now within this envelope of possibility when we include greenhouse gas forcings. And of course, the likelihood of this event will rise dramatically in the future. So this is how we use projections in large ensembles to study the climate risk of, of events going forward and to understand the, the drivers for the events we've seen in the past, such as the summer heat wave. But doing this in a unified system has a lot of advantages because we can evaluate both how well the model projects such events, but also can we actually predict these on even shorter time scales. So here's another example of how we use such models for climate risk assessment. This is a very general category of, of tasks we want to do is to look at the risk of changes of the climate system, particularly in extreme events as we go forward <clears throat> into the future. And using this unified system has a lot of advantages. Here's an example of South African drought over the years 2015 to 2017 in South Africa. Here's Cape Town here. They experienced a very severe uh, multi-year drought. It was a so-called day zero event. And the dams supplying Cape Town were down to about 20% of their capacity in May of 2018. And if that drought had continued, if they had hit below 13% of capacity, they would have had a so-called day zero. They would have, would have had to disconnect much of the municipal water supply. So we can use use uh, models to estimate is that a response to climate change and how might that risk grow in the future. Using a, a very similar set of experiments, this y-axis here shows the percent chance of a multi-year drought, and these are uh, calendar years here, and these are model simulations in which this drought was extremely unlikely uh, prior to about 1990. But after that time, the greenhouse gases kick in, climate change kick in, the likelihood of this drought has increased. We think we understand some of the mechanisms and it will rise dramatically into the future. So using this unified system for climate risk assessment is a very valuable tool as we look forward to planning horizons over the next several decades. And these are critical time scales in which a lot of planning takes place. So why is this SPEAR system significant? We're number one, we're using the very latest generation of, of coupled ocean atmosphere land ice modeling system. We use new components to state-of-the-art and, and improve fidelity in representing the various aspects of the climate system, the MOM6 ocean code, FE3, atmospheric dynamical core, and LL4 land model. Land model. <clears throat> we're using a unified system. So we're doing predictions and projections from seasonal to centennial time scales in the same model. And that improves the credibility and robustness. So there's interactions between the time scales we can properly represent. And this is system now is already contributing real-time experimental predictions the North American Multimodal Ensemble, that's for seasonal predictions, through decadal predictions as part of a World Meteorological Organization international program, and to NOAA seasonal outlets for temperatures, precipitation, and hurricanes. And by using these new state-of-the-art components, we're improving skill of seasonal to decadal climate prediction, and with new capabilities emerging. For example, some of our new research shows that there's an ability uh, to <clears throat> predict California atmospheric river activity some eight to 10 months in advance. Very exciting new results that come out of this improved state-of-the-art uh, system. And we use large ensembles with the exact same system to make climate change projections. And we really use those for assessing climate risk. What are the events, what are the chances of severe events in the future as we go forward? That's really important for many sorts of planning activities. What are the, what are the chances of uh, very uh, severe uh, snow seasons or lack of snow in the West? Lots of examples that we can take. And this model output is uh, freely available. So it's a, it's a community resource that we've made available through this website. And we're inviting the community to look at our climate change ensembles. I will stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Very, very interesting again. And I'm very interested about the California Atmospheric River because I know having grown up in a farming family that uh, the irrigation districts really want those long-term outlooks for, uh, for putting out water uh, allocations. Are we ready up with Gong? I think we're going to do a little experiment. Uh, so if everyone can uh, give me a moment, let's see. Um, Dr. Liu, can you can you hear us? Dr. Liu, I've unmuted your your microphone, and hopefully, let's try one more time. <laughs> we have this beautiful presentation up, but uh, we're having some technical issues in terms of uh, getting him his audio work to work. Let me try one more thing. Thank you, everyone. Let's see. Dr. Liu, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can, we, we can hear you. Oh. All, right. All right. That's good. Sounds good. Dr. Liu, go ahead. I've got your presentation up and just tell me when to start. 
Okay, so presentation is, is on, right? Okay, so I, so I have to like uh, refresh my browser, um, probably drop out for a second. No problem. While Dr. Liu is getting set up, I just want to remind everybody that a few of our pre presenters have provided their handouts, their slides as handouts. So if you're interested, please look at the control panel and you'll look and you'll find uh, two, two handouts from two of our presenters today if you'd like to download those slides. Dr. Liu? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, that's great. Um, sorry about that. So thank you very much for give us this uh, uh, chance to uh, showcase our uh, NOAA Coral Reef Watch uh, Next Generation Satellite uh, Coral Bleaching Heat Stress Monitoring Products that were uh, operationally uh, launched uh, um, last year. Um, so I give this presentation on behalf, on behalf of the entire uh, Coral Reef Watch team. Um, so, um, so, uh, um, so as we know, Coral Reef Watch, um, Coral Reefs, uh, are among the most uh, diverse uh, ecosystem on the earth. Uh, the uh, the size of individual reefs uh, range from meters to tens of kilometers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, shallow water coral reefs uh, um, are uh, sp uh, spreading uh, throughout the uh, the tropical um, um, oceans, uh, but uh, they only um, cover only one tenth of one percent of uh, ocean floor. Next slide, please. Um, so in the past few decades, uh, coral bleaching, especially mass coral bleaching caused by extreme heat stress uh, has become the number one um, contributor to the decline of the coral reef ecosystem um, globally. Uh, a healthy uh, reef can become um, bleached uh, after uh, a few to several weeks. And um, affected corals may die if the uh, heat stress uh, persistent for long or very severe. So this is uh, an example from uh, American Samoa uh, during the third global bleaching event. So uh, uh, in situ, uh, the monitoring of environmental conditions uh, over large reef areas uh, to produce, uh, to provide uh, this near real time synoptic view to provide a warning, uh, that's just, uh, impossible to do. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, where Coral Reef Watch uh, comes in. So since 1997, Coral Reef Watch program has been using a set of uh, products uh, based on NOAA operational satellite uh, SST analysis uh, to monitor heat stress conducive to coral bleaching and uh, provide uh, uh, the warnings to coral reef uh, communities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first, uh, the, SS, uh, the daily SST uh, analysis uh, is compared with a climatology that is associated with the coral's uh, uh, heat stress tolerance level and uh, to produce a uh, map called a coral bleaching hotspot. Uh, hotspot is a SST anomaly type of a product um, detecting and uh, measuring the instantaneous uh, heat stress conducive to uh, coral bleaching. Uh, then um, the uh, daily hotspot over a uh, running window uh, of 12 weeks uh, are accumulated into a product called a degree heating week. Degree heating weeks, um, uh, the value of degree heating weeks is directly associated with the occurrence and uh, uh, severity of the coral bleaching. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so then um, um, bleaching alert area product uh, categorizes the, the values of the hotspot and uh, degree heating weeks to provide uh, a level of potential severity of uh, bleaching. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, a set of uh, the uh, hotspots uh, and degree heating weeks thresholds are used to determine uh, the level of the uh, uh, bleaching alert. So you see here, alert level one in red color, alert level two in brown colors are the two alert levels, uh, providing, uh, providing warnings to potential significant bleaching. Uh, 
and a severe potential severe bleaching uh, with significant uh, mortality respectively. So this is a very convenient and an informative uh, tool for coral reef uh, managers. Next slide, please. Uh, coral Reef Watch is a uh, service that started uh, in 1997. That was uh, three years before the coral reef, wa coral reef Watch program was actually uh, established in 2000. Um, yeah, 2000. So uh, the first generation products uh, were at a twice weekly uh, 50 kilometer resolution. Um, they retired uh, in 2020 uh, when replaced by the next generation product suite. Um, the next generation product suite uh, is at a daily five kilometer uh, resolution. Uh, it is the latest uh, version is 3.1 one uh, and based on the NOAA this operational daily five kilometer uh, geo polo blended nighttime on SST uh, analysis. Uh, this latest version was implemented uh, in 2018 experimentally um, and uh, went operational in 2020 um, in time uh, for celebrating Coral Reef Watch's uh, 20 year anniversary. Uh, the development uh, started in 2010, uh, shortly after the very first version of uh, Nestis uh, five kilometer daily as a scene an analysis became available operationally. Um, uh, that that is a uh, at that time it is only the uh, day night blended SST analysis. So in 2014, uh, the version two was developed and made available um, after the um, nighttime only version of the SST and has become available uh, per hour request. And uh, um, the reason for nighttime only is that they produce a much more stable and uh, conservative uh, the measurement. Uh, uh, so we can do the monitoring at a uh, higher accurate, uh, accuracy. So uh, then in 2018, the version three becomes uh, available uh, after we made a significant improvement to the climatology itself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, hotspot is a, a SST anomaly based product. So it needs uh, is a compatible long term SST time series uh, to derive climatology. So after a few iterations uh, over many years, uh, trying different historical data sets, uh, we eventually put it together a long term time series uh, called a Coral Temp. Um, by, combine, uh, by combining uh, a few best uh, um, historical SST um, time series available in 2017. Um, so uh, uh, so based on that, uh, we were able to, uh, uh, to, to derive a um, uh, the workable uh, climatology to, uh, to further improve our product. Uh, so I want to mention that uh, the uh, um, reprocess the NOAA Geopolo blended uh, nighttime only SST of 2002 through 2016 uh, developed the per hour request uh, really uh, made uh, this possible. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the um, coral temp is also very important for us uh, to validate uh, products using data um, from the past coral bleaching event this is very important and also uh, allow us to evaluate uh, any change, uh, long-term change in the coral bleaching heat stress. So, so the bottom figure is shows one of the time series of uh, uh, the change of uh, heat stress over time from 85 all the way to current. Next slide, please. Uh, so the third global uh, coral bleaching event occurred uh, just one month after our second version became available experimentally to the public. Um, this is the longest and also wise, uh, most widespread bleaching event ever occurred, lasting from 2014 through 2017. And uh, the, uh, the, the top panel shows the, the maximum heat stress level reached during that uh, three-year event. Um, the animation so shows the uh, heat stress was rolling through the global oceans uh, three times over. Um, based on our product and uh, observations, uh, we see that the major, uh, the most of the major international coral reefs uh, are affected, and all U.S. coral reefs are affected. So um, 
Um, so um, sure, shortly um, after this event started, uh, our products was used throughout the core reef uh, communities as critical tools for monitoring, for making um, bleaching response decisions, uh, for coordinating in situ survey, and also also for uh, uh, general public education and out outreach, among others. Next slide, please. Uh, now, um, going back to the product suite, the uh, next generation product suite. Uh, so based on our uh, global satellite products I mentioned earlier, um, we also have five kilometer regional virtual station product um, uh, for providing warnings to individual reefs. Uh, there are 214 uh, virtual stations in total, uh, cover all the global coral reef areas. Next slide, please. Uh, for each uh, virtual station, uh, there's a set of uh, gauges uh, to show um, the current uh, heat stress um, condition based on our, our satellite monitoring and also um, uh, um, potential bleaching heat stress over the future, uh, uh, for the future few weeks uh, all the way to a couple of months based on our uh, four months uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal uh, bleaching outlook uh, product. Uh, time series graphs and the data are uh, provided as well. Uh, and also we send out automatic emails to the subscribers. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, the uh, Coral Reef Watch's uh, early warning system is the only global early warning system for any change in the Coral Reef uh, environment. And um, um, so we are actually a bridge between the satellite data providers and the uh, core reef users. Uh, we're providing end-to-end uh, -end products. Uh, we uh, directly in engage with both the uh, users and the satellite data providers uh, uh, from a product development, uh, improvement, uh, implementation, delivery to trainings. Uh, at this moment, uh, we are developing a new version of uh, Coral Temp uh, and a, also a new heat stress monitoring algorithms. Um, the new products uh, may become available later this year or maybe next year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we know coral reefs are extremely important. Uh, so uh, our products are uh, designed and created uh, uh, to help uh, coral reef conservation and uh, management uh, to mitigate uh, devastating impacts from mass coral bleaching um, events. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I will conclude my presentation here with this slide, uh, providing the, our website and also email address along with social me uh, media address. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me this uh, chance to uh, give it this um, presentation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, that you were able to, to get join us today and do your presentation. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions, but I do want to leave at least one or two minutes. Uh, if you do have a question, please enter it in the chat box and let us know uh, who your question is directed at. Um, meanwhile, I just want to remind you that this was a recorded event, so if you missed uh, some of the earlier presentations, I will have the recording on the, the um, NOAA Central Library YouTube channel shortly. Eric, did you have any anything you wanted to add? Yes, I, I too wanted to thank uh, Dr. Liu for the uh, great presentation. It's been gratifying over the years to watch the evolution of the Coral Reef uh, watch program. I've been involved with it uh, in the past, so it's very, very uh, interesting to see the evolution. Thank you. Excellent. Um, we do have one question. It's for Dr. Arnaud. Can the HDGM models be used to support the overtime error drift that is expected with the WMM model? Uh, I know if you if you could unmute yourself, please. I'm oh, sorry. Could you please repeat the question? Of course. Um, the question is: Can the HDGM models be used to support the overtime error drift that is expected with the WMM model? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think actually that's one of the um, you know, initial motivations for developing such a model that is updated every year instead of being updated every five years like the WMM. And um, yes, I mean, to that, that largely addresses this issue. Um, the reason why we, we, we keep you know, the current five-year cycle for WMM is because there is such a large community of users that um, you know, who have software that have been developed over the past uh, you know, years and sometimes decades uh, that, you know, that, that we I mean, it's our understanding that it's not practical for them to, to suddenly shift from a five-year update to one-year update. So that's why we, we keep this, uh, this five-year periodicity, which for, for many applications is, is sufficient because as long as the, you know, the military specification is, is met, um, and this is a product that satisfies, the, that meets their needs. Excellent. Thank you for, for that response. Um, I, I don't see more questions. I, I like to give, oh, here's another question. Uh, this question is for Dr. Calhoun. The question is, the resolution of the models are different from the Earth Network data, lightning strike. How does resolution play into the GLM products, and how does the effect uh, does that affect the utilities to the forecast, um, forecasters? Um, yeah, so the resolution of the Earth networks is pretty much exactly where it happens. You know, it within a kilometer. Um, that's true for a lot of the ground-based systems, um, but they're not providing the full horizontal extent of the lightning, uh, where the GLM is producing the horizontal extent of lightning, but when we talk about like the gridding of it, um, we can grid it down to two kilometers to uh, approach some of the other ones, but the resolution at nadir or at basically satellite pointing straight down is around just under eight kilometers and it spreads out to about 12 kilometers um, as you go out towards the far extent of essentially the camera. And so, yeah, that does play a role. Um, we would love, and I think in the future design of the next kind of lightning mapping sensor for space is gonna at least cut that in half. Um, I think that will be a little bit more useful. I think that's probably one of the biggest detriments right now is the resolution of the GLM. But um, we're excited about what we can do with it now. Um, data simulation for models is already showing a lot of impact even at the um, bigger resolution, but I think it'll be even better as we go towards the next generation. Hopefully that answers the question. I think so, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, yes, uh, the person who asked the question says thank you. Um, I'm not seeing more questions. Uh, did any of the presenters have any last comments before we, we sign off? Eric? Uh, no, I just uh, invite our listeners uh, to come back to the next uh, webinar in two weeks from now. On April 7th, our final seminar in the NOAA Science Report series will be technology and science highlights. We'll include lightning talks uh, about a variety of things. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today and we wish you well for the rest of the day. Yes, and I'd like to conclude by thanking our speakers for sharing the research with us, as well as Eric and the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee for organizing this series. Um, NOAA Central Library is proud to host presentations like today's that feature the work of the NOAA community. And we hope that you will all join us again. So be well, everybody. Take care. I too thank the uh, speakers for their wonderful presentations. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.